precedent that people, again, pastors and people like to talk about, the voice of God booms out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove and all of that. And then the Bible says right after that, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And so these are the kinds of things that kill the understanding that people have about what it means to walk and live by faith. The faith walk is not all about the pursuit of the American dream. I will grow up in a home, you know, mom and dad in the house, and I'll grow up and I'll go to school, I'll go to high school, I'll graduate, then I'll go to college, I'll put four years there, then I'll graduate, then I'll come out and I'll pursue my career. That's the American dream. But the American dream does not always line up with the walk of faith because the walk of faith has uh, us following the way of the Lord. And sometimes when we're following God, and I can say sometimes, all the time, when we follow God, there is opposition. Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffers violence. It is opposed violently is what that means. So anybody that goes after the will of God immediately comes up against fierce, violent opposition. And in that opposition, then that means that there are delays, there are detours, Sometimes there is destruction. To put it in even better terms, sometimes there's divorce. There is death. Because we're going after God and his way and we live in a fallen world that in every aspect of it is opposed to God. So that when a person chooses to follow the will of God, then immediately there is opposition. That's why there are all of those things that I just mentioned. A couple can start out, both of them, going after God, but along the way, because of the opposition, the husband or the wife can say, I, I don't want to do this no more. That's real, and that happens because the kingdom of God suffers violence. It is opposed violently. Sometimes there's death. A person can get so discouraged and down about the opposition because their dreams are delayed, because sometimes they are detoured and they have to go a path that they didn't expect to go. So they give in to the temptations of the flesh that we talked about a few weeks ago. The temptations to tempt God, the temptations to give in to the lust of the flesh, the temptations to complain, the temptations to give up and to go back. And when you do that, you make yourself wide open to death coming into your life. And so there are people who have died prematurely because they sold to the flesh, as the Bible says, and of the flesh they reaped corruption. They sold death, they reaped death. Yeah, even as a believer. And they went to heaven, but they went to heaven early. They went there in bad timing. They didn't go at their appointed time. They went, they, God had to allow, God allowed them to suffer the consequences of their decision. And their decision came. Most people's decisions that take them out are decisions that they make while they're in the heat of disappointment while they're in the middle of discouragement because life isn't going like they thought. It isn't going as they planned. I remember after my, after my own brother died, my, and uh, his daughter, my niece, uh, asked me the question, Uncle Chris, why did God let my daddy die? The Bible says that if I ask anything in his name, in God's name, in Jesus' name, that I will get, have whatever I ask. See, these are the kinds of questions that people do ask, and these are the kinds of things that lead most people into destruction because the answer 
if you try to answer that question apart from the wisdom of God, the only answer that you can come up with is that God must not be fair. God's not fair. We already know that life isn't fair, but what really gets us when it seems like God isn't fair. And if you haven't discovered how unfair life is, as the old school people used to say, just keep living, you will discover how unfair life is. The young phrase that young people use today most of the time is that life sucks. That's a horrible way to put it, but that accurately describes it. It's it's miserable sometimes. Things happen that are very unfair. People make decisions and their decisions affect us. I need to say that to you young people tonight. Sometimes people make decisions that have nothing to do with whether you made the right decision or not. I remember when I was in the fifth grade and at the time, I was taking some, uh, they were offering free music classes in the public school, in the St. Louis public schools. And I discovered my niche up until that time, all through school, I was struggling uh, with math and English and all the things that you have to take when you're going through kindergarten, first and second, third and fourth grade. In fact, my fourth grade teacher had a, had a conference with my parents and suggested that maybe I was uh, a little mentally retarded because I wasn't doing well in school. Uh, but actually, I was just bored. Uh, in the fourth grade, I had the, I had the multiplication table already memorized. So when they were going through the class and going through two times three is six, then three times three is nine, I was, I already know this. I was bored, but she thought I was mentally retarded because I wouldn't respond out of my boredom. But what I'm getting is by the time I got to the fifth grade, I finally something came along that piqued my interest and it was music. And they began to, they gave us all these little xylophones. Y'all know what the xylophone is. I love that instrument, vibes and xylophones. And, uh, and I, and gave us and began to teach us how to read music and to play. And two of us were the most outstanding in the class on this instrument because it came naturally. Those of you who have musical gifting, you know what I mean. It just comes to you and I found my niche. And, and also for the first time, I was no longer the butt of the jokes in class. Uh, I was one of those kids that was picked on through kindergarten through fourth and fifth grade. But in the fifth grade, suddenly I had something that I excelled at and I was better than everybody else. <laughs> Perfectly timed because for me, when I was in the fifth grade, the Jackson Five came out. And so you had an African-American family doing well in music. So suddenly to be musically gifted was popular. And so I had a musical gift at the time that the Jackson Five became famous. And so finally, I had something on everybody else. I was good at this. But then somewhere, somebody made a decision. And the funding was cut for music in public schools. And suddenly, it was gone. And never again in my entire school career was I able to get back to learning how to play and read music. The closest I got was by the time I got to my junior year in high school, 11th grade, went from the fifth grade to the 11th grade without touching any music. And suddenly in 11th grade, I started singing in the school choir. But that's a lot of a gap, huge gap in time to be away from music. It affected my life forever. A decision was made that had nothing to do with me. I didn't quit music. It was taken away. So life can be very unfair. Not only mine, but thousands, millions of young people's lives have been affected by decisions that are made. Funding cuts, certain courses not even offered in school. I'm convinced there's millions of kids could have been bilingual, trilingual, if certain things had even been offered to us. 
but it was never offered. I'm not here to blame the system or anything, but I'm just simply talking about there are certain things that have happened, decisions that made us, and it's unfair. What am I getting at? You don't know what the future holds. If America breaks out into major war tomorrow, and all of you young men are drafted, it would drastically affect and change every plan that you ever had for your life, a decision being made that has nothing to do with you. That's the world that we live in. And so what I'm hoping to drive home to you in this brief exhortation is that this is what it really means to walk by faith. It doesn't mean all our dreams will come true. And that's what we should be pursuing. All our expectations will come to pass. And that's what we should be chasing. Unfortunately, that's what the church teaches in America. But that's not what it means to follow God. We don't chase our dreams and pursue our desires. Our pursuit is of God himself so that no matter what life brings, no matter what unfair things happen, I can always be found smack in the safety and the middle of God and his will and his plan. I'm convinced that you guys heard me talk about this a couple of months ago. That's what happened when you hear the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the three guys that were thrown into the fiery furnace and the preachers preach and they sing and they, oh, and they went in the furnace. And I, well, the real story behind that is there's three guys that find themselves uh, basically prisoners of war and brought into a whole nother culture and city. And they are forced to learn another language and to go to a whole nother school and to put it in modern day terms, they're forced to major, to de they, they, they don't get to declare their own major, they're told what they're going to major in in school and they have to do it because they're going to serve another king and in another kingdom. That's the story behind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So as much as people like to shout and rant and rave about that story, the reality is they were in a place they didn't expect to be, didn't want to be, but they found the strength and the ability to trust God. I don't know why I'm needing to share this with you guys tonight. I know that we are in crises. I know that we're facing deadlines, aren't we? <laughs> and I don't say these things to kill your faith and make you think nothing's going to work out but I'm calling you into a much more mature understanding of what it really means to follow God. This is the kind of stuff that you don't fill church buildings up with. If I stood up here and talked about how all your dreams will be fulfilled and God's gonna help you do it, that's the, kind, that's the reason why church buildings fill up five, 10, and 30,000 members. But when somebody stands up and just tells you the truth, no, the truth of the matter is that uh, there are some people, there are thousands of people who have been executed, killed, so that we can freely read this book today. They gave up their lives for this. And they did not give up their lives for the gospel and the Bible to be reduced to a get-rich-quick scheme. They didn't give up their lives for all of us to come along in the 21st century, and the whole point of this Bible is that this is our master plan for the personal success of our own individual lives. That is not what they died for. This is the master plan 
for the dream of God to be fulfilled in the earth. And by embracing this master plan, we find out our place in that dream being fulfilled. Otherwise, we will all have sad endings like what we've just experienced with Michael Jackson, where you can gain the whole world. And then in a matter of months, lose it all. And in what was supposed to be his triumphal comeback, just a week short of the big comeback, life is over. So the goal is not just to become all that we desire to be. That's not what this is about. I'm saying some pretty heavy stuff, but it's because you guys got what it takes to hear this. You have the foundation built in your life now to hear what I'm saying to you. This is not a popular thing, but it's very necessary. I don't know what the future holds. I read the news like you. I see things on the internet just like you. There are some disturbing things happening in the world, and I don't know how much you keep up on world events, but some pretty disturbing things are happening. My wife is my witness. I have been preaching what I'm about to say to you for 20 years, and that is this generation is not going to grow up and experience life the same way we have experienced it growing up in America. You are not going to have the same type of life. You are not. You guys know that little thing that sometimes I run, uh, that video clip, it says that, uh, as an example, those of you who are in school is saying, that especially if you're involved in technical uh, training, the things that you are learning now by the time you graduate, that information is going to be obsolete. That's how fast the world is moving. That by the time, I think the statistic was, by the time you guys are 30 years old or something like that, you will have been on 14 jobs. It's a completely different world. I mean completely different world. Life will not be for you. For us, it was what I talked about. It was go to school, graduate, get on a job, and work that job for 30, 35 years and retire. That's not going to be your world. And we're gonna watch a lot of people start to make the adjustment from that. It's the reason why the banking industry and the mortgage industry, that's the reason why they offer people 30-year mortgages, because they expected people to stay on the job for 30 years and to pay off that house. In today's world, that's not going to happen. So everybody's got to rethink how they're going to do things. Everybody has to change. Why am I saying this? Because, ladies and gentlemen, when I hear about certain things like North Korea firing missiles, When you hear about certain things, United States troops going into Afghanistan, I don't know if you understand the political ramifications of these things, I don't know if you understand the economic ramifications of these things, but what I'm saying to you is part of the reason that you don't have a job, those of you who are looking for jobs, the part of the reason why you don't have a job is because of stuff going on all over the world. Part of the reason why we're in the position that we're in is because we are now interconnected all over the world. And so you've got to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about, God, where should my heart be? How should I be pursuing you? There are certain things that are going to catch us by surprise, but they're not going to catch God by surprise. 
And so since it's not going to catch him by surprise, that's why he wants our hearts and our lives and our attention focused and settled in on him, really on him, really on him. I'm not here to talk politics. I'm not here to talk war and all that stuff. But I want you to understand that if you're not anchored in God's will, you will be one of the ones I'm talking to. And I love all of you. You're my, you're my family. But you will be one of the ones who will be falling away in your faith because you'll be so angry or hurt or disappointed about how the future unfolds. Hear me closely. I didn't even plan to say all of this tonight. I just feel this on me now. That's the reason why. The focus, the emphasis on our lives. I mean, been in this time of consecration before the Lord and fasting and prayer. It's part of the reason why I don't know why I didn't do it sooner because I, it's almost like I knew God was going to start dealing with me like this. I knew he was going to start talking to me about things like this. About the real purpose for which we are here. I dare not do it. I cannot do it. I can't preach the same message that many pastors and ministers are preaching all over this city, all over this country. And that is, run into God and everything will be okay. No, it's run into God and he will preserve you. That's what the Bible teaches. It doesn't say everything's going to be okay, but he says, I will preserve you through the storm. I will accomplish my purpose through your life. So the safest place always to be is in the will of God. What do I mean by the will of God? In obedience, in submission to him. Thank you, Lord. Wow, I didn't plan to say all that. Just take a moment right now just to absorb that. Lord, I thank you. We thank you now for your word. Help us, Lord God, to get a real true grip on you. Not just on our dream, not just on our plans. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I'll be obedient to you, God. My Lord. What God is after, everybody, boy, I sure didn't plan to say this. My God, why are you taking me this way? What it comes down to is that we cannot pursue God for stuff. We can't pursue God just for his hand. When Jesus walked the earth and the miracles were happen, happening, when people were being healed and when he was passing out food, crowds, huge crowds, as long as God has given me what I want, huge crowds. But one day he turned around and looked at everybody and he said, you're going to have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. He started talking about making a total commitment to him. He started talking about living for something greater than just yourself. And when he started talking like that, crowds disappear. Because something inside of us, as long as it's for us, we will chase after God, we will pursue him, and God knows we have needs. I'm preaching to myself tonight, guys. God knows we have needs. But he will not reduce himself to just being Sometimes the phrase we use is God will not be a cosmic bellhop. The person in the hotel lobby who just grabs our luggage when we need. He will not be a waiter or a waitress. God will not be Santa Claus. 
just gives me gifts if I'm good. He is God. He is all powerful. He is all mighty. God has a plan for the nations. He sent his son to buy back the world. And then he left a little group of people on the earth and entrusted them with that message and with that word, with his very presence. We read that story of how on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in like a mighty rushing wind. God entrusted these people with his presence. And those people were so infused and had been so purified and so much of their self and so much of their own agendas and so much of their own plans was now wiped out that they could just meet together and praise and worship him. They could listen to a group of men who knew Jesus face to face. They could just sit and listen to them talk. These same people could just go over one another's house and just share and talk. If they heard about anybody that had any needs, if they lacked anything, they didn't have a social welfare system like here in America. They couldn't go in and put in an application for food stamps. They couldn't go on public assistance. The government, the Romans weren't passing out free food. So these people who had been infused with the presence of God and the responsibility to live a life so that the real purpose for God, for the planet, could be seen and could be experienced and could be embraced. These same people, if they heard about anybody that had any needs, would just put their little money and resources and things together to help anybody. That's what I'm talking about. What God wants to do through this ministry, and he's told us to change the name to Urban Life Church. What God wants to bring, the life he wants to bring to the urban community is not another church coming into the urban community telling everybody and feeding upon everybody's desire to get out. Most people in the urban community, especially in the inner city, in the ghetto, in the lower income areas, they just want to get out. And it's so easy for a ministry to come along and preach the message of, we can help you get out. And here's how you get out. Say these magic phrases, quote these scriptures, memorize them every day, and God's going to help you get out. That's not what this is about. He will help people to get out, but that's not what this is about. This is about the reason why Jesus came and he took getting whipped with an instrument that was called a cat of nine tails, which was like a leather strap with bunches of strands, but it had pieces of bone and razor sharp spikes and all of that in it so that every time it hit him, it would grip his skin and the person who was whipping would yank it back. It wasn't like you see in the movies where it's just swatch. 
no, no. This was a thing that dug into the skin and then you ripped it back. And he took 39. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. Transgressions are the stuff that we not only did wrong, but we were born into the world wrong. We were born separated. So he took every one of those rip for our transgressions. It says he was bruised, and a bruise, as you, most of you know, is an injury that's below the skin. You know, when somebody punches you or slaps you and it breaks the blood vessels underneath you so that the skin turns red or purple or black and it puffs up. Internal injuries. The Bible says he was bruised because these guys, these were Roman soldiers. Elite squad. Today, it may be something like Navy SEALs, Marines. Can you imagine a bunch of Marines beating you up? So it wasn't the movie blow. You know, the movies, it's a glancing blow. No, we're talking full in the face, bone crunching, teeth breaking. Boom. Bruised for our inequities. The word iniquity carries with it a meaning of a person that's just do whatever they want to do. They are lawless. They don't just do stuff against the law. They do whatever they feel like doing. If it happens to be lawful, cool. But if it happens to be against the law, that's cool too. It also means and iniquity is something that's bent or broken or deformed. He was bruised for our deformity, our rebellion, our lawlessness. So the reason for this keep pointing back to this. The reason for this message, the reason for us living this way is not to make a bunch of money and try to become famous and get all our dreams fulfilled. No. He didn't die just for all of that to happen. He died for something greater to happen that the purpose and the plan that his father, God, Jesus, his father had for the earth and for all of us as his children, that it would actually happen here on the earth. That's what we're here for. I'm here to tell you that, I'm here to remind you and myself that this is the real reason. So the reason why there are people who died trying to preserve this book is because through the history of mankind there have been efforts to destroy this story, this reality. Throughout the history of mankind, massive efforts have gone forth to try to snuff out the reality that Jesus came, that Jesus rose, that he is alive today. The reality that God loves people. He's not angry. He's not frustrated. He's not full of wrath and waiting for the next moment to throw bolts of lightning and to take you out of here. People have died 
giving up their lives to try to make sure that this message keeps getting passed on from one generation to the next. And no matter what it takes, people have taken the personal responsibility, not just pastors, they weren't all pastors, they weren't all evangelists, they weren't all missionaries, they weren't all apostles. They were moms and dads. Some of them were doctors or attorneys. Some of them were janitors. Some were school teachers. Just regular, everyday people who took on the personal responsibility that I will make sure that this message is kept alive and passed on to the next generation. So that even if all of my plans for my life don't come about like I want them to, that I will make sure, thank you, Lord, I will make sure that it is never forgotten that God loves us. He sent his son who sacrificed everything for us. This is the reason for my life. We live our lives, the Bible says, to the praise of his glory. That's what will keep you anchored. So that if in the days ahead, I don't know if this will happen, but if in the days ahead you are alive when war hits America, if in the days ahead there is another 9-11 type of event and everything that you ever planned is gone forever. You gotta understand, that was the effect of 9-11. I don't know how old you were on September 11, 2001. But part of the reason why we are in the economic crisis we are today is because of that event. America has never recovered. I don't know why I feel like I need to share these things with you guys, but I want you to understand those are not just isolated things that happen that don't affect you, and I'm talking about things that are yet to come in the future. When those airplanes hit those buildings and those buildings came down, I want you to understand that it's called the World Trade Center because it was a headquarters for most of the major economic structures and buildings and companies in the world. It was an effort by those guys to bring the world's economy down so that their nation could come to the top and take over the world. I want you to understand, that's how close we are. And even though they took those buildings down and a lot of companies still stayed in existence because of electronics and internet, it still affected America because the airlines were shut down for two or three weeks, which shut down the uh, tourism businesses, which shut down hotels, which shut down everything, food, restaurants, everything was affected. That one incident sent our nation into an economic tailspin. Some of you, you may have lost your job during that time. They had to lay you off. There was no business. There was no money. So that if there is another 9-11 type of event that hits this country, if one were to hit tomorrow, I want you to understand, those of us working for the state, we will never get called back. Why do you say that, Pastor Chris? Is that a statement of negative? No, that's a reality. If another one hits this country, every industry will shut down. Everything will shut down. 
some of your grandparents who maybe they are in their 70s or 80s. They remember America when it went through that before. It was called the Depression. Every, nobody was working. There was no food, y'all. It wasn't no just run to the store and get something from the grocery store. No. And so we can't imagine that happening in America, but we are this close. So I'm telling you, young people, I'm not predicting these things will happen. I'm just telling you that's why your life has to be lived for something greater than just, I'm going to pursue my dream. I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to get my dream. I'm going to have my career. This has to be God and his word. So that no matter what the future holds, we used to sing this song growing up in church, I know the one who holds the future. And then you will learn what it means in Psalm 91 when it says, a thousand fell at my side, 10,000 on the other side, but it didn't come near me. Then is when you understand what it means to dwell in the secret place of the Almighty and to be hidden in the shadow of his wing, where even though all of this stuff hits everybody and we're all affected, that still somehow, some way, he still takes care of my family. And even though I can't go to school right now, this is a reality. My wife and I got a chance to be missionaries in Western Africa uh, about six years ago, 2003, yeah, six years ago. And we went to an African nation that had been torn apart by civil war. And we met young people who were in their 20s, like most of you are here tonight, and they hadn't been in school in seven years because when the war broke out, everything was destroyed. Grocery stores, schools were bombed, everything was gone. And so they found themselves at 20 something years old, now having to start in the ninth grade. Because they hadn't been in school, they hadn't had any education since the time the war broke out. So even when the recovery time came, they had to start from where they left off. So instead of me walking across a college campus and receiving my degree at 21 and 22, they found themselves starting in the ninth grade. That's the reality. Thank you, Lord. So the place of safety and security is, Lord, my soul follows hard after you. I give you my life. You gave me your life. And now I give you my life. That's what the great exchange really is. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I, it's not just words that we sing in the song. I live for you 